Okay, so if you want to follow along, if you go to the um, ICAPS Tutorial 5 page, um, click on the tutorial website. Um, probably shouldn't start one minute. <laughs> But there'll be a there's a Google Colab link in here, basically. Okay. Kind of using some standard tools, and the idea is to kind of try to at least introduce the set of problems that we ran across. And again, I'd be I'm very interested in any thoughts, information, especially from planning folks or other folks that have been working at the intersection of RL and planning. Um, so maybe I will put those on a board because there. Um, as folks recommend, you just start the uh, start the pretty picture introduction. And this is, of course, you know. So I'm going to try to do stuff. Oh, oops. I'm going to try to do. Um, Things that should not really be done in a Jupyter notebook in a Jupyter notebook. So um, <laughs> we're going to see how well that works, uh, or if we manage to crash things and have to restart halfway through. Um, both are distinct possibilities. Okay, so this is um, some work. So my name, sorry, my name is Nate. Um, I am based in Tacoma. I work for Mobius Logic. We're a really small consulting firm that is kind of technically based in DC, but we're fully remote. So, um, but we've been working primarily with uh, a group in the Air Force Research Lab called ACT Three recently. So, ACT Three you may have heard of. Um, they were the people that flew. They had an autopilot that flew a jet recently. Well, last year or two, um, and they are the kind of the AI research arm. In so much as there is a dedicated AI research arm there, that's who in the Air Force Research Lab Act 3 is. Um, they are uh, pretty dedicated to basic research and open source and whatnot. So all of this is out there in open source. There's, of course, stuff that I don't work on that is less open. But um, you know, they're kind of trying to hew as close to the academic community as possible, kind of staying around you know, the early technology readiness levels at this point. And so um, we ran across a series of problems that we're really interested in getting ideas, feedback, anyone who wants to work, collaborate, et cetera. Um, and we're hopefully going to provide tools. You were hopefully in a position to provide some tools to make that a little bit easier as well. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing is trying to basically build out some of these tools that have come from academia, but haven't, you know, there's not a good code base yet so that we can make then the continued research and development a little bit easier. Um, I am not an Air Force employee. Nothing that I say you should construe as being any anything but my own opinion. Um, but this is a set of problems that people uh, across a wide swath of things have been very interested in recently. So I'm um, really any any academic collaboration, any word from folks that know more about this than us, I think would be really appreciated. But so first, this kind of started in space. So um, this is a picture of space operations where you have a you know chief satellite deputy satellite chief is trying to find something so the deputy satellite is trying to find something wrong on the chief satellite or photograph you know the chief's been damaged it's trying to photograph different points um and there's a project called stars to use reinforcement learning to try to just basically just do some exploration of what are the alternatives to control theory methods um the problem with space so here what we're seeing is um in space, if you have things orbiting the Earth that are close to each other, they'll kind of appear to orbit each other just because their uh, their uh, orbits are shifted slightly, and so all the physics gets complicated and non Euclidean. Um, problem with space is that uh, nobody trusts AI, as they should not, because if things go wrong in space, it can cost a billion dollars. Um, <laughs> and so there needs to be a chain of command, and there needs to be people actually trusting things. And um, that has been a real barrier uh, for, you know, I mean, frankly, good reasons. It's not like, you know, these are Luddites that, you know, shouldn't, you know, are holding progress back. They have very valid concerns. And these are also concerns that go across a lot of products. So one of the 
ways that we decided to try to kind of tackle this was say, well, what if we basically build some very, very simple agents that do some specific skills, right? You know, something like go to a waypoint or turn your camera towards a point on the uh, on the chief or track something or, you know, get into a stable orbit, you know, just these kinds of very, very basic proprioceptive kind of skills that RL tends to be pretty good at. Um, we train those agents and then we want to create a planning agent that can take um, those policies and run out a human readable plan, right? So here, what we're seeing is we have some waypointing agent, right? Saying, okay, here's you know, here's the plan. First, go this waypoint, then this waypoint, then this waypoint. Great. Right. Inspection vector going in a certain direction. And the idea is, is that then you know, so we can um, a human can actually evaluate this plan, and if they trust the onboard waypointing agent enough, that's simple enough that they can say, yeah, you know, I've run this thing a hundred thousand times. I know that it always works, right? You know, I've played around with it. We have digital twins. We have this, that, and the other thing. I'm not asked, being asked to hold my nose and have the thing just do the whole mission for me, especially in that sort of wonderful stochastic way that RL things tend to do things. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just, I can just direct it. Basically. So um, that was the idea behind this. And basically, in trying to actually build the system out, we were, we realized that um, first, it's pretty general. Second, we were solving a lot of stupid problems that were like not hard to solve, like we weren't coming up with any brilliant solutions. They just need to be built. And so we figured, well, okay, so since we've built this, why don't we put it out to the community? Um, because in particular, once you get um, these agents built, whether they're RL agents or control theory agents or decision trees, whatever they happen to be, um, how do you generate these plans? How do you generate them given Temporality. How do you generate them given that they have um, uh, parameters that may be integer valued, they may be real parameters, they may be quite complicated, right? And how do we generate them given that really the situation that we work in here, we would like it to be fast, right? We would like to be able to generate hundreds of plans or thousands of plans so we can do counterfactual analysis, right? And we would like to have a system that we can then bring it in front of subject matter experts pretty quickly and say, it's the same, you know. Does this look? Does this look right? You know, because at the end of the day, I'm, you know, I'm not a subject matter expert. I am. My background is in. I'm a pure. My background's in pure mathematics. You know, I just kind of stumbled into this field for various reasons, and so, you know, I've learned some about space, but it's much better to be able to say, okay, you know, here, people that are actually working in space, does this look right? And be able to kind of rapidly prototype some of those things. So that's the idea behind Coach, and. Um, so I'm in this tutorial, what we're gonna go through is a very simple example because basically we just want to build this on top of as many existing tools as possible. So that, you know, on top of and working with. So like that as much as possible, you can bring whatever you want to bring. You know, do you like stable baselines? Great, use stable baselines. You want the RL lib, use RL lib. You have your own simulation, at, you know, great. as long as it, you know, is a gym interface, should work. So this is basically just a very simple layer that sits on top of a standard petting zoo multi-agent implementation. Um, and what I do for this tutorial is just pick a random petting zoo environment, but um, as much as I love petting zoo, uh, their environments are currently a little broken. So <laughs> but you should also note if you are using any of them, be a little bit careful. Um, but okay, so here's the basic problem that we're gonna try to solve in the next hour and 10 minutes. Um, there's an environment, it's called Waterworld. Look on it, it's a standard petting zoo environment. Um, you can do similar things for any environment, although there's choices that need to be made. Let me see how to go there. So if you're interested, it's just a standard little multi-agent environment. You can see here, we have poison, we have food, we have obstacles. And we have our little agents that are trying to eat the food and avoid the poison. And they have sensors coming off them represented here, represented by these radial things. Uh, so it's kind of a nice system where, um, you know, they are not getting global information. They're just getting local information. Um, pretty simple. Sorry, sorry. Uh, poison is green, food is... Yes, thank you. Just stop. And you can, there's parameters to spawn these things in or out or whatnot. Um, 
you may notice there is a slight uh, issue that they have in this environment as well um, with how they're doing their collision detection. Uh, so you should be able, just be aware of that. <laughs> if you see if you see something pass through something else, then it's not too bad, but it's it is there. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so you can take a look. Observation space is you know basically your sensors, and the action space is very very simple. It's just a vertical thrust and a horizontal thrust, and the, there's some physics -y momentum, drag, et cetera. OK, so here's the problem outline, right? If we solve this, we can throw standard RL tools at it. We'll get a solution. And it's actually not too bad. Um, this is our simple environment. Um, but we kind of want to use this as a cartoon to say, well, OK, so instead, there's three skills that are going to need to be learned here. Actually, before I move on, I'm going to suggest that anyone who's going to be following along, let's go down and run this line of code here, this first one where we clone the repo and start uh, doing the installation because for some reason, stable baselines, which we're going to use here, uh, really does not like the Torch implementation that natively sits on Colab. And so it takes like five minutes to install. Um, <laughs> yes. So the objective is to just eat as much food as possible? Eat as much food as possible while avoiding uh, the poison. And I think that there's also a penalty that you can adjust for how much thrust you use. But they, like, it can be. So this is part of where, um, so that's a very interesting question, partially because uh, the definition of collaboration is a little up in the air. You can share rewards. Um, I would highly recommend against doing that. This is, per this is Nate's personal experience, but if you share rewards in this kind of proprioceptive game, basically what happens is this guy gets a reward here and this agent has no idea why. And so it just randomly gets rewards and it doesn't know why back and forth. And it basically just adds a bunch of noise to the training data and screws things up. So um, you can, if you if you want to train this to be a shared reward game, you can uh, bootstrap it without having the shared rewards and then try to put the shared rewards in. But uh, I would, you know, I had a, a, somebody look at that a while back and they can find that they got the, that the results were really any better. Um, there's no message test. Not in this. Um, there is a, there's some other petting zoo environments that actually are explicitly looking at uh, similar games with message passing, but in this one there isn't. But yeah, it's a really is, and that's actually one of the one of the things that we've been looking at as well as like what is cooperation and how do we define it? And, not. So the, the way that the simulation works is that basically there's a slider that you can set at the beginning, what percentage of rewards you want shared. So without recoding the simulation, that's basically all you get. Yeah. So this is basically, philosophically, this is kind of the, the difference that we're thinking about here. So that instead of, um, so this is the kind of trajectory that you might get uh, from just a standard, you know, PTO kind of you know, strategy, we have to. So it has to learn to avoid poison, eat food, and explore. So these straight lines are what we're going to try to do instead. So we're going to say, oh, the radio line. Sorry, those are sensors. <laughs> yeah, those. Yeah, and actually, um, only if they hit the sensor. So you can have poison through. Oh. Okay, so, okay, so this is what we're going to try to do instead. We're going to try to take this environment, off shelf environment, and um, basically train these guys to, to go to waypoints instead. Uh, with the idea that we're going to train them to go to waypoints in the environment so that um, they do still try to eat food that they see along the way and try to avoid poison. And then hope that we can train a director agent to. Um, and say, okay, so now we have these agents that can do this thing that have this skill. Now we want to train a director agent to actually direct these, you know, a director agent that can see the whole game board to sort of place these guys around and tell them where to go. And my argument, the, the point of this talk isn't to say, hey, this is so much of a better solution. It's to say, hey, this is actually pretty easy to do with, with a coach. 
So if you have a simulation that follows gymnasium petting zoo is just multi-agent version of gymnasium, then uh, doing this kind of thing is actually pretty straightforward. Doing it well may not be, but yeah. Are you running out of time to keep asking questions? No, 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 this is great. Yeah. Okay, um, so the, the target spots, um, mm -hmm. are they known to be so we're going to make these known to the agents. We're going to make these, um, so these are going to be relative to the agent's uh, current position. So it's like we're going to actually expand the observation space so that in addition to seeing the food and the, and the poison and everything else, it also has a relative coordinate, or it has a pair of relative coordinates for the next waypoint. And they're specific, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, uh, we could do it differently, but, but uh, we, you know, in the in the way that uh, you know, I kind of have this uh, originally envisioned, um, each agent can only see its own waypoint. But there's no reason, in principle, you can have it see more. Yeah. Any other questions? And so then what I'm really interested in is so okay, we can train agents to do this. We can talk about this algebra of different, you know skills and blah, 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 blah. So well, from the planning folks, what is the best way to then train the planning agent? That's what uh, I'll show you a simple, a stupid way to do it. Um, you know, that gets some results, maybe it's not that stupid, but it's certainly not anywhere near as sophisticated as, as the stuff that most people here work on every day, so. Okay. Um, all right, so coach high-level overview, basically what it is, is we have some petting zoo environment, we're gonna train some agents, Things environments have some roles, and we're just going to slot these skilled agents in, and then we're going to generate plans based on the skilled agents. Um, what this means is um, we need to decide what skills the agents in the simulation are going to have. This is not, so if you've heard the options critic framework or the options framework, um, there's a lot of hierarchical RL that tries to train the um, policies, both the, you know, the higher level, lower level policies. We're not doing that in this case, we're just going to fix the lower level policies. We're going to train them separately. You could train them iteratively. Um, I don't have, that may be the best way to do it. But in this case, we are not training them both at the same time. Um, we are also kind of, um, there is some skill discovery work that a lot of people do. Uh, in this case, we're not trying to discover skills. We're just going to say, you, you know, we're going to, we're going to stipulate them. Um, you can do skill discovery stuff with coach, people do it, it's just, you know, again, this is actually a fairly simple piece of software that we'll hopefully see, you know, software is a simple, you know, library. Um, but so in this talk, we're just going to assume that we know what the skills are. Well, I think actually, yeah. in general, I think that you will need to know what the skills are because the other thing is, um, so in general for these skills, these skilled agents, um, we're also going to require that an interface is provided. So an interface basically just says what parameters are public to the uh, to the train to the director, you know, to manipulate. Um, in this case, so this version of what a course of action is, so uh, for an agent, is very very simple. Um, that is one of the things with coach, which is different than some other planning things, is that we have fixed it to basically be. Um, I want to know what actions or what, what skill that I want to use and when I start using that skill. Those are the two pieces that are required. So more complex like temporal algebra kind of stuff where you say, okay, I want to do this before this happens or when this triggers, then do this um, is not natively supported at this point. Um, it could be um, if that is a, a direction that, you know, there's enough interest in, but this is kind of the, uh, this was the, the, the first crack at it first. So. Okay, so we have these skills and we have these interfaces. I kind of just want to pause for a second and say, so like what kind what do we mean by skills and interfaces, right? So once we once we have these interfaces, right, then it's actually pretty easy to see how we're going to train a director, right? We just say, okay, well, for each at this time step, you know, put these parameters in the skill and now iterate that or you know, just figure out what the you know time series of that is, right? So like, how do we figure out what the interface is? In our little waypoint interface for water world, it's gonna be pretty simple, right? It's gonna be, yeah, at this time, go to this waypoint. 
and then it will wait until it either gets to the waypoint or communicates, hey, something's gone wrong, or you know, um, a fixed time interval is passed. Um, but it's worth you know sort of thinking. I mean, back to the the cooperation question. I mean, something that you're thinking about. So like, what if you have something like a team of players coordinating to perform a practiced play as a skill, right? So that's a multi-agent cooperative skill. What kinds of parameters do we actually use if we want to do a plan? Or in American football, right? You know, American football is a game of plays. You sit down and you draw out a plan, and then you have a bunch of autonomous agents on the field that try to execute the plan <laughs> as things go wrong. And then, you know, you see what happens. And so, like when we're thinking about interfaces and skills, you know, I think it's you know kind of quite general. Like you know, how do we you know what 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 is it that we're actually uh, um, what kinds of things we can possibly do? And this is kind of a an open question. So the waypoint example is really easy. You know, something a little bit more complicated like a coordinated gameplay. You know, the parameterization is a little bit trickier. Um, I've already kind of said this before. Okay, great. This is done. Um, anyone else following along? Hopefully it's done as well. Cool. Okay, so let's just give a quick review of Petting Zoo. So Petting Zoo is a reinforcement, sorry, is a standard that came out of reinforcement learning. It came out of Gymnasium, which is now run by Farama, but was run by OpenAI. Um, Farama is a small organization that is trying to take on too much. And so, you know, I, although I have some complaints about them, they're wonderful people and, you know, they just kind of, they're trying to keep the reinforcement learning open source community going. So give them some love if you have a chance. Um, but basically what Petting, what they did, uh, so what OpenAI with Gymnasium was set down a, look, there's all these different RL standards out there for what the simulation should look like. Let's fix them so that people building tools know what, sim, you know, what to expect from a simulation. And similarly, uh, people who have a simulation know what to expect from tools. It's very, very straightforward. Um, I think it was just a multi-agent analog of that. And basically, you're going to have three things. You're going to have a reset for your environment. So this brings the environment back to the beginning. Great. You're going to have a step. So this is basically, I'm going to take some actions in for each of my agents in the environment. And I'm going to do one step in the environment. And um, I'm going to have a render. So give me a picture of what, of what just happened. Um, I should say, I'm going to talk about parallel environments here, which we're going to be sticking to. So in the multi-agent setting, there's a question of like, are you playing are you playing StarCraft where everyone goes at once, or are you playing chess where one person goes and one person goes and one person goes and one person goes? We're going to assume that everybody goes at once. There's ways to transform back, back between those two games. Um, so the step function takes an action, um, or in this case, a dictionary of roles to action, um, and returns some ob the agent's observations, the agent's rewards per step. Um, each agent, whether or not it's terminated, so terminated is, these are a little bit contested, but the standard way it's thought of is that terminated means that it has ended for a valid reason in the sim. Um, you know, it crashed or it, you know, fulfilled its mission or something like that. Um, it could also be truncated. So truncated means that something happened external to the sim, like we ran out of time steps, right? Or um, we decided to shut it down because we didn't like what the score performance was. So that's the kind of internal external division. Either way, this just means the agent's not acting. And then info can be whatever you want. Uh, yeah. What's the difference in mechanics? Nothing. They're just both. They're both booleans. In, both terminals. They're both terminal scripts. Yeah. And in, this is kind of a thing because different versions of gymnasium and petting zoo we treat them slightly differently. And, 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 and gym, which is just done by the gymnasium. Yeah. And Dow Gymnasium's new release version is coming out, and I think that they are hopefully clarifying some of that as well. Um, so yeah, <laughs> right. it used to just be done, and now you have to do a you know 
especially in the multi so in the multi agent thing you have to say okay well has this agent terminated or truncated and this agent terminated or truncated and this one and this one, this one, this one. so but um so it's a nice little it's very simple which is one of the things that's straightforward about it and it's one of those funny things where you'd be shocked at how many different variations you sort of look at it as no level yeah that's obvious but before this came out and even now you can find them. how many different variations of what it meant to be a sim you could find. <laughs> so um in this case so petting zoo um everything should follow the petting the petting zoo interface um there's some other things of course they put in like basically how do you figure out how many agents are in there and we'll kind of talk about that but we can grab a petting zoo environment um we can cast it to be parallel um Parallel, this is uh, versus AEC. So parallel means everyone goes at once. AEC means that one agent goes, the next agent goes, the next agent goes. Um, running reset is going to return us our observations and info. And, you know, okay, what do we have? We have our observations. Well, we've got a pursuer. We've got some data on its sensors. And, you know, this is some big... Uh, some big NumPy array. So actually, once we can say sewer zero, and just grab the shape. Let's look. Okay, it's 242. That's what we expect. Um, and then we can take this feed into a neural network, start doing our reinforcement learning. Um, if we want more information about what is actually in this environment, uh, there is a possible agents that's always implemented. So possible agents means this is the this is the agents that could possibly exist in the sim. Uh, it does not mean that they so the active agents are going to be in agents. Okay, great. Both for possible agents are active. Usually good for a start, although sometimes not. Um, we can also grab uh, observation spaces and action spaces. Um, so, view observation space of put in any role. So, in this case, let's just do two, zero. Okay, and this is a box um, in this case. They can be much more complicated. This is just telling you that um, there are 242 values, therefore 32 is the minimum is minus square root of two. Maximum is my is square root of two. Um, similarly, the action space. It's going to be a box between minus two. Great. It's supposed to be the thrust in the horizontal and vertical direction, so that all makes sense. Um, boxes are kind of cute objects um, in that they have one or two little things, but you can sample them, for instance. So a very quick, like, you know, if you're trying to build just a quick sort of proof of concept, yes, my simulation is working. No, it's just okay, careful. <laughs> Keep something like, you know, I in range 10 um, environment dot step. So now I need what do I need to do. I said, okay, so I need to provide a um, an action for each of my agents. So say. Sewer zero. Well, I don't really care what it is. Um, so I'm just going to grab for zero for sewer zero's box and sample it. Do the same thing for sewer one. And then, oh, before I actually run this in a loop, I'll just do it once so we can <laughs> see what we get there. Oh no, so it returns a whole ton of information. Um, and this is that uh, observation, so observations, and then um, the rewards at each step, termination, truncation, and info for each agent. Pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay, let's skip this since that's what I just did. So we can, for instance, do the same thing. So this is just some, uh, did that by hand. We can also, of course, do you know dictionary builder, list builder notation to say for each role that is currently active, each role in agents, do the sampling and you know, take an action. 
It's usual to split these things off into observation reward term trunk info. You know, and we can run through this and do this multiple times and, you know, whoops. And randomly put a pipe in there for some reason. And uh, bring them up rewards. At this point, these guys are just wandering around randomly in our sim. Um, I don't think we can render in this notebook, but we may as well try, right? So if we say mode equals human, if you do this on your computer, uh, okay. It should, okay, so it doesn't know how to do mode. That's fine. There are some inconsistencies here. So if we render this, we will get a, we're calling <laughs> without specifying the render code, good. <laughs> yeah, and so now we have to, now, how exactly it wants me to specify the render code here. It probably wants me to do it in parallel. Anyway, I'm going to move on for the moment. <laughs> this is uh, unfortunately very specific to the version of um, gymnasium or petting zoo that the code was written under and not the version that the code is currently sitting in. So, OK, so that's petting zoo. Um, Stable baselines is a piece of software that you, that is it's some libraries for reinforcement learning. Um, there's a lot of different ones out there that you can use. Uh, RLlib is uh, very popular. Um, I like it because it's very, very good for rapid prototyping. It's very, very simple, and it has a good implementation of PPO, um, which if you have not read this, if you if you have not read this blog, uh, this is now, they are now up to, I think this started at 20 things that are hard about implementing PPO, and they're now up to 37. Um, and, Yes, 37 uh, implementation details of PPO. It's basically 37 things that can and do go wrong when people try to implement it. And the big problem is if something has gone wrong and you're trying to implement yourself or somebody else's, it'd be very, very hard to know because things will update and seem to be training or doing something and it will just never converge. So um, you, should, you, can, you can and should use any library that is compatible with Heading Zoo, they're great. I'm only using steel baselines because it's simple. Um, RLlib is more industry standard, but it also tends to eat all of your CPUs. So, or not eat, but reserve them. And so it's a little harder to do in a two kernel book. It does not, as very, very observant. <laughs> so, <laughs> PPO, however, is not multi agent. It's not, not PPO, sorry. Steel baselines is not multi agent. Um, there's a hacky way to get around this using a library called SuperSuit. Um, SuperSuit basically says, if all of your agents are actually the same, right, then we can just spin up one uh, neural network and feed all of the rollouts from all of the agents into it. And then stable baselines just happen with that, right? It's basically just a pair, it's a version of parallelism, right? You know, it says, I'm gonna take the rollout information, I'm gonna learn from all of these identical agents as opposed to just learning from you know this one and this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, it does not work, it fundamentally does not work if your agents have a different observation space, a different action space, or have different roles. So even if they have the same observation space and action space, if you want, say, one to be a chaser and one to be an evader, it's going to try to train both of them at once um, on the same neural network. So this is a very, this will work in this one specific situation, it does not work in that. <laughs> Going policy, policy It should, yeah, it's giving you the same behavior under the same observations. So there are there are tools that um allow you to do things with truly multi-agent training. I think that. RL lib does, I think that Agile RL does, um, you know, not to plug our own stuff, but we publicly released a tool called Morpho Polo, which does, which is what we primarily use for multi-agent training. That was based off some of the work of Kenneth Stanley and those folks um, with Poet and uh, their evolutionary algorithms where you're kind of trying to build and evolve environments while also spawning out many, many agents. Um, so that that is what I would. I mean, what I personally do is I just use I use Marco Polo because that's what is it does it allows you to do that and works. But I think that Agile and RLlib do as well. 
Um, Tianshu uh, does in theory, but Tianshu has a lot of problems, is um, what I would say. I spent a lot of time trying to get it to work about a year or two ago, and some of the implementation, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong, I think it's just an open source library, and so they, you you have many things that have been contributed, some of which work and some of which don't. Um, so, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's something I wanted it to work better than it did when we tried it, and it may have been, it may have been improved by now. Um, but they're actually their PPO implementation they took from zero baselines, uh, and so that is one part of their implementation that provided you. It's like a parameter sampling problem. There's like a in PPO you sample the uh, or the. Um, the neural network provides basically the sent the, the the mean of a gout of a, some distribution around the actions at the end and then you sample from that. And if you don't set that correctly between discrete and continuous games, then it can fall apart as whatever. Remember. Just yeah. But it's um yeah, but if it, if it I would say though, if it's working, great. <laughs> yeah. Um and it should and you should be able to do everything here with. Um, any of those libraries, you know, provided they you put in some stuff. Because I mean, that is like part of the interesting thing, right? You know, this is just we're going to do one homogeneous or one agent, and especially for cooperation, you know, we really want to see as different agents doing different. So, um, but this is basically so. Here is just some very very simple training code with SuperSuit, and I'll kind of go through it. Um, this is basically ripped straight from. Uh, Stable baselines website. Um, what it's going to do? We're going to take our environment, we're going to reset it for good measure because sometimes things don't get created until you reset them. Um, then uh, we're going to use SuperSuit to turn it into a to do the vectorization here. Um, it will just pickle it and copy it. So if you have any issues, it's usually a pickling issue. Um, then. Uh, Try to put it on some CPUs. Well, one CPU in this case. Um, we're also going to put in an eval callback. Uh, and the reason for this is that it doesn't, not, without putting in an uh, evaluation callback, it won't actually save any reward information. <laughs> um, it'll save all, all the beautiful training details, but not the reward information. Um, so we can start TensorBoard down here before we start this little mock training. Um, Tell it to learn for a dozen time steps. Do, do, do. Uh, we can also go here and open up. You can start to see. We'll start dumping things on the instances drive, but then here we go. So this takes a second to start up, especially because it's there. Doing, <laughs> you really shouldn't do uh, multiple or multi-threading things on CoLab because it already has it's already multi-threading in the background, and then but um, so we should start generating some telemetry here. And here we go. We have some episode lengths rewards. We're slowly training our little our little agents to go around to meet things. Okay. So again, this is just all off the shelf. Um, the off the shelf tools are good. Uh, you should use them. Uh, there's good communities around them. Um, I'm going to interrupt this because. That's basically what we want to see. Okay, great. So training with stable baselines, super easy. Um, it should be basically as easy to train with uh, with RL, Lib, Tianchu, Agile, other things. Um, okay, so, but now we want to actually train agents to do something, right? So in this case, the agents were just trained based on a reward function. So, you know, we we're saying go around and eat things. So if we want to change the simulation now a little bit so that they actually follow a waypoint, what's the best way to do this? Um, 
okay, well, what's a way to do this? The best way to do this is to rewrite everything in C, um, but we're not gonna do that. Uh, so we're gonna do a slightly worse way of doing things, which has become slightly industry standard and this is actually a problem as well. Um, we're just gonna write a little wrapper around the environment and uh, we're just gonna then take the returns from step and add in uh, the waypoint observations. Easy enough. Uh, then we'll just generate some random waypoints and give it a reward based on how close it gets to the waypoint. Um, the reason that this is bad, I just want to say, is because if you start wrapping things and things, and you start and you will start to discover uh, that the methodology that um, gymnasium and petting zoo sort of based on involves wrapping things and things and wrapping them and things and wrapping them and things, and then all of a sudden um, you don't know what you're actually accessing, and this is a little bit problematic. But we're just gonna blaze on forward <laughs> doing just that. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, there's a little bit of code here. We can go through it, it's pretty simple. Um, basically, so there is an observation space. This is very important news, that box thing, right? And this is what tells um, your optimizer what the expected size of normal is. Um, observation space and action space. The action space isn't changing, the observation space is. So we'll need to redefine the observation space. Um, We'll also need to add a function to add in the relative waypoints. So that means that we're going to have to get the absolute position of our little guys, get the waypoint absolute position, and uh, compute what the relative uh, coordinates are. Um, we have to add a reward function, right? So now we actually want to reward these things for going towards the waypoint. Um, and then we probably want to add visualization. Otherwise, we'll just be staring at the same picture and hoping that we can make some sense out of it. <laughs> So given our timing, I mean, I'm assuming that I'll well, program, we can go through this pretty fast. Basically, the big things that we, I mean, is there interest, uh, is there interest in seeing me live code this or I can just go and ex give the quick explanation because it's not. Yeah, all right. Okay, the next cell, the quick explanation. <laughs> um, so basically we have to get the unwrapped environment. This usually works to um, get a, to basically drill down through however many wrappers may be on it to the base. Uh, in this case, it does not um, because the water world environment has an additional wrapper on it that it hides. So we can get the unwrapped environment and then we have to get an environment inside the unwrapped environment and this will give us the actual scale of the, the import. <laughs> um, so. This is really, this is very, very straightforward, except there's just like weird. Um, so then we can decide, okay, so what is, what do we want to say is close, is arrived at a waypoint? In this case, I'm just going to say it's a scale divided by 10. Um, so basically one tenth of a, of a distance along the board. Um, so the reward structure we then have to decide on and um, so this is going to be the reward for actually getting there. And this is based roughly on the fact that um, the reward for eating uh, the reward for eating things is like what is it naturally? The reward for eating food is 10. So we, you know, so in the, the, the scaling, you know, there's definitely going to be some scale. How much do we want it to go to a waypoint versus how much do we want it to eat food versus how much do we want it to avoid poison? You play around with all this. Um, I'm just going to set it to 20 arbitrarily. Um, there's also another reward, though, that I'm going to put in, um, which is basically a reward for getting closer. Okay. So let's take let's look at one over the distance to the to the current waypoint, and multiply that by ten. And get a give it a reward for that, so that it's getting a reward for getting closer and closer. And closer. Um, we take our original observation space and we just concatenate, you know, <laughs> the boundaries for the um, current observations. So zero zero is going to be the top right hand corner, the top left hand corner. I think this is the bottom right. Um, create a new box out of that, um, and then tell it, uh, assign this box to the agents, and now we'll have the correct, the correctly sized um, observation space. 
Um, we need to change the reset because we need to add in this. Uh, so reset returns an observation and we need to add in observation here. So great, let's do it. Um, we'll make the observations. Similarly with the steps, let's make observation function just concatenates on the relative position. The relative position is just gotten by going into the background environment and grabbing the position, subtracting it from the waypoint. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, and then we render, which just involves doing some drawing. Um, okay, and do this, we can go ahead and um, so we create this, uh, we then a parallel environment here is going to just create a water world environment. We're gonna knock the max cycles down to hundred because naturally without doing that, it's 500 and in this case. So many architectural decisions that I'm brushing over here, right? So including that the choice of reward structure, but then also um, when you get to a waypoint, does it spawn a new waypoint? Does it end the sim? What happens? So in this case, we're just choosing to end the sim, um, give you some points and end the sim. Uh, we wrap it with this and everything appears to be working. We can run our training code again. Do this really fast. And then there's some built-in functions. Um, so this callback will start saving things in the best path. We do the best model. It's already been saved. We've got it on a relatively low number of time steps, so it should finish fast, although you can see it already having a heart attack down here. And so my experience, so with this kind of thing, if you actually, you know, play around with the parameters a little bit and you train it for um, a day, you'll get a pretty good little waypointing agent. It's very simple, you know, this is very, very, very simple. Um, so here we go, this is done. And we can generate some GIFs. This, I just, this is just a built-in function, or this is a function that comes with code. It's very, it does exactly what, I mean, you guys have all written functions that do this, you know, just steps through the environment and re renders each frame and records it. So, um, but, There we go. You can see here's our little waypoint. And even a couple of cycles in, and nope, no, that's not true. I was going to say, even a couple of cycles in, and they're starting to go towards it. They are not. Uh, this is the waypoint for that guy, not the waypoint for that guy. <laughs> As you can see by the fact that the waypoints don't disappear when they enter the uh, when they enter the boundary. So that's unsurprising. You know, it's not that surprising that we can train it. We can't train it in 30 seconds, but uh, if you get it like, I mean, even 10 minutes, that's a pretty good job. Okay, but that's kind of not the point of this. The point is that now we've done this, so this is a really standard RL task. We want to take these agents and use them in a hierarchical setting. So that's where Coach is going to come in. So what is Coach? So Coach is a wrapper that um, basically holds a simulation in a stable way. It's part of the goal. Um, so the idea is, is that um, you can uh, specify a course of action in terms of time series. So these are commands that you're giving to your agents at certain points of time and then roll time forward, you know, an arbitrary or as far as you want. Um, you can also pause the simulation and roll off sort of counterfactual um, trajectories and to see what happens. Um, because of that, um, this is going to assume that there is some way to change the underlying environment. Um, there are many, 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 many different standards for this. Uh, nothing's been set down. So we're following what we did with Marco Polo and just saying, okay, so the environment should have an augment function that says, I want to, so I want to change the fundamental parameters of the simulation somehow. You call this, you change the parameters of the simulation. Um, you also see, so uh, we really want everything to be seed reproducible. A lot of things out there are not, um, but basically for statefulness, uh, seed reproducibility is, is pretty important um, because otherwise it's just not clear how much it matters that you're saving states if you immediately start changing afterwards. It also allows us to implement a really cheap, um, 
well, I shouldn't say that, a really stupid and expensive um, <laughs> version of statefulness, where basically as you run anything in coach, it just records the actions taken. And then um, even for simulations that don't have a state, apparently uh, a state that can be outputted, what it can do is it can just output the full trajectory and then you can run it again from the game. So you can say, okay, start with this seed, run these actions, great. It's not a good solution, but it's one that works for anything that's seed safe. Um, so that's kind of the goal. We want to have these, you know, so we want to be able to take a simulation environment, put it in, um, plug agents into it, and then um, run courses of action for those agents. And uh, so to set it up, so we have this coach environment. So this is not a gymnasium environment um, it, because it, uh, you know, you may be running multiple steps at the same time. Um, observations, rewards, and whatnot are potentially different time scales. So it will be slightly different. Um, in order, you know, we'll show there's a wrapper for gymnasium environments that we'll use. But basically, uh, it should still be pretty simple, though. So all we need, the only, like the minimum stuff that we need to spin up a coach environment is we just need um, an environment creator. So this is for uh, your simulation. So this is assuming it's a petting zoo environment and then a parameter generator. So a parameter generator is something that, um, an object that will supply parameters to the underlying environment. Um, in the simplest case, it, it provides the same parameters every time and the same seed every time. Uh, there's also some stuff provided to, you know, same parameters, but stochastic samples of seeds, or, you know, you can stochastically sample them for um, other parameters. You will, of course, have to set that up for whatever simulation environment you wanted to work with. Um, uh, we'll also take um, basically, so optionally, let's include agents. So, which agents do we actually want in each role? Um, whether to fill any agents that we don't supply with an agent that just acts randomly and takes no parameters. Um, a communication schedule. So, this. Um, is a very important object that we'll say more about, that I'll say more about. Um, basically, it says, how do we want the, um, the, the director or the planner, whether it's a human or another or an AI, to be able to communicate with these agents? Do we want it to be every step, every 10 steps, every um, 10 steps but offset by four? Um, do we want it to be, you know, first on step 70 and then on step 512 and then on step 32? Here at all, that's not right. <laughs> then we time travel. <laughs> um, do we want uh, um, agents to be able to break the simulation and, you know, pause the simulation and say, hey, give me another command? Um, and so once we decide on that, so if we don't supply this, then it will just assume that there's no communication. Um, but if you do supply it, we, we, there's, some, the, there's a bunch of tools we provided to build them, then you can either, you can start building that, that out. So for instance, in the space domain, there are, this is where it's, you know, sort of came from, there are just times. You just get to communicate with your satellites at specific times. And if you don't get it, then it's like, well, sorry, somebody else is using the radio. Um, but we also want to kind of make it applicable to things like, you know, low communication situations, right? You have, you know, underwater vehicles that have short range communications and you want them to go off and do, you know, collect soil samples, something like that, come back. Um, so we're kind of trying to make this as general as possible. But basically, so here's what we do. We grab coach from the environment. I'm going to just throw this in since we cloned it instead of installing it. This just says, hey, I'm just gonna add coach to the path anyway. Um, then from the planning, we have a base parameter generator and a communication schedule. So the space parameter generator just takes some a seed and some parameter dictionary and returns that seed and parameter dictionary every time it's sampled. Um, and we're going to grab a this petting zoo environment wrapper. So this just takes any petting zoo environment and wraps and makes sure that the, everything is sort of being communicated to correctly. Um, we're going to create so then our environment creator is we wrap our petting zoo environment in the wrapper and we create our coach environment. Great. Okay. Um, so um, we can start doing things. So for instance, we can take a step. 
taking a step in the coach environment is going to return um, basically doo -doo -doo -doo, the final observations and rewards and everything else like that. So it will take however many steps you specify in the underlying simulation, however many are specified by the communication schedule. We'll run it forward until either it says this is a communication time or an agent calls back and says I need help. Um, and then it will return the final, um, yeah, so the final observations and um, any additional information. It will also return this piece of information about why it stopped. So in this case, did it stop because the steps were reached because uh, some or some steps that you specified were reached? No, because we didn't specify them. Uh, because of termination or truncation. Uh, in this case, yes, because it just ran the environment till the end because we didn't get any communication schedule. <laughs> um, or until somebody called and said, hey, my course of action is finished. So, um, but more so, so the step here is, okay, fine. Um, we can also, so we can grab though all of the information. Okay, yeah, sorry. Now, the, now I need to reset it actually because it's only because the environment has been is finished. And so it's like, hey, there's no, there's no pursuer zero. But we can grab all of the information from the rollout in the state. So the state holds the parameters that we supply to this particular rollout, the seed, and the trajectory length. And then inside that, for instance, we can get oops, trajectory. all of the actions, all of the observations, all the rewards. Um, if we turned on rendering, we can get all the frames as well. Um, so that is one of the things is that rendering is a little, you know, we can't really follow the uh, the um, standard petting zoo gymnasium rendering thing because what, we, what do you want to do? Do you want to render every time you communicate? Do you want to render all the intermediate frames? Then you're returning GIFs and not images and the whole thing breaks. So we just said, okay, well, you can render, you just turn rendering on, run it, and it stores it, stores all the frames in the trajectory. Um, you can specify how many frames, you know, take a frame every 10 steps, five steps, one step, et cetera. So this is kind of, so this is basically how Coach operates. Um, it is going to, uh, so spin up an environment, simulation that sits inside it, um, run agents in that environment based on courses of actions that you provide, um, and then, return everything in terms of a, tra a trajectory. And so if you have a specific environment that, so that you want to do interesting things with, you can, you know, this is a visualization of a full trajectory using Dash. Um, there's telemetry functions that you can say. So um, take this, uh, or, you know, specify that this is the telemetry that I want to collect based on the trajectory. There's some uh, examples of how to do that in the, um, uh, in the other examples, uh, so, but that's basically um, what the object is. You can also um, simulate trajectory, so you can run forward a certain amount of time, stop, and say, okay, hey, I want to simulate, you know, given this course of action, what would happen? Um, so, Okay, that's all well and good, but we created a little, sorry, let me pause. Are there any questions? I'm just kind of going now. <laughs> you guys have been very, very patient. Yes, so up to this point, um, there's, there are no different actions for agent that you want to take. There's... Right, so at this point, the agent, so I've only put, I've had, I didn't put any agents in, so the so it just filled it with agents that take random actions. Right, but they already, well, I don't think you specified, but mm -hmm. theoretically, you could now put in the schedule and they would. Return observations for agent depending on that schedule. Exactly. And we're gonna and we'll do that in just a second. Yeah. And right, and so it'll do it. So we could, for instance, I mean I can actually jump ahead. Maybe one question. Why did you yeah, divert yeah. from the gymnasium um for the updated uh basically because um uh there's different reasons that we want the simulation to be able to end and we want to know why. So um, for example, um, having the simulation be able to end because an agent has requested the simulation end. 
So again, not so not in the simulation, but a, a the agents that we create don't necessarily have to be policies, right? As we'll see in just a second, they can be policies, but they can you know they can be more complicated objects, including things that say, hey, I've gotten myself into a situation that I don't like. Please end the simulation. Um, we also so we wanted to know when. Um, so not only do, is the agent still alive, but um, has the you know has the the simulation ended because of um, you know we've run out of steps because an agent has has uh, ended it, um, or because it's terminated or truncated. So if we hit this could have yeah, it could have been all included in the info, but um the basically, oh yeah, the the more maybe the more pressing question or maybe a, a more pressing question is, why didn't I specify an action? So the, the the real reason is that this is kind of fundamentally not a pet, this is fundamentally not a gymnasium environment because instead of specifying actions, I'm specifying entire time series of actions now, right? And so a simple way to generate those would be to just say, well, this is a one step thing, right? Where the director agent generates the entire time series with all the parameters and everything else. The problem is is that that's um, sort of combinatorially huge, right? But it's it's a possible solution, um, you know. But basically, we wanted this to be able to ingest a time series somehow. So a time series of actions. Say, okay, at this point, do this. At this point, do this. At this point, do this for each of my agents, and then run a simulation based on that. And that it, we will show. I will show one way to get that back into a pet into environment. Um, yeah, because one basically once you specify a communication schedule, then it's somewhat straightforward, right? If you specify a communication schedule and say, well, run forward to the next stop in the communication schedule, return all the observations to a director, and then that's kind of your step back and forth. But we wanted to leave this part of the environment open to different ways that you could solve it, right? Because as soon as you, um, as soon as you lock, as soon as you, there are certain choices that are made in the petting zoo gymnasium interface that lock you into using an RL framework as opposed to these more generalized planning tools. Right. So if you're trying to use hierarchical, uh, like, you know, hierarchical temporal algebra stuff, um, it wants a very, very different set of outputs. So we, and there's like different ways, there's different choices that you can make about how you turn this into an RL, you know, compatible thing. And so I kind of, we kind of decided that we just wanted to keep this as a different object and then spin off different ways. You say, okay, here's one way you can turn it into a petting zoo environment. Here's another way you can turn it into a petting zoo environment. Here's a way you can turn it into, you know, some other kind of environment. It's dangerous because we're creating a new standard. <laughs> you know, but it's a very good question. And it's a, it's a, it's, it, it's a very non-trivial question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wide question. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. Well, and, and anytime somebody is like, there's a standard that everybody uses, but we didn't, you should immediately ask why. <laughs> because, but frankly, there's often not a good reason. Um, and I don't know if this is a good reason. Maybe it may, you know, time time will tell, I suppose. Um, part of the reason, though, again, is that... Um, With this, uh, we just, you know, we, and this again could be a wrapper, it could be another way of doing things, but we basically want to be generating hundreds or thousands of different trajectories that we can compare. And so kind of doing things in the unit of these trajectories seems to be natural. Um, so very good question. <laughs> um, so, kind of an over states and trajectories, uh, communication schedules. So, um, we have so communication schedules basically have uh, two kinds of things. One is a, a check in schedule, and one is a blackout schedule. So, a check in schedule says, um, you know, when we hit this, go back to, you know, stop the sim and, you know, 
let whoever is on the other end do things. Uh, the blackout schedule says that during the blackout schedule, agents can't request new commands. So, um, again, it says, you know, okay, well, you're going you're going out of sensor range during this period. So even if you run, you know, even if you run out of something in your course of action, you don't know what to do, you can't pause this and go back and get new commands. Um, uh, in this case, so. The simplest way to, to do this is just on a repeating schedule. So, you know, you just basically say, well, what's the check-in frequency? What's the offset? What's the blackout frequency? What's the offset? Um, what's the line for each blackout? Um, can the agents break or not? And then does this repeatedly? You only do it once and you go, right? Um, this is, in some sense, uh, very much just, you know, so now we're just doing petting zoo kind of stuff, but with a step meaning a longer thing. Um, you can also specify a more bespoke schedule, but you know, so it's fairly straightforward. We just specify a comm schedule, take the same creation code as before, give it a comm schedule, and take a step in the simulation. And there we go. So now our so we reset, we take a step, our trajectory is 17, including one for the zeroth uh, entry when you hit reset, and one for the fact that it's created space for the current step. So 15 plus two. Um, there's a couple of other, so these are, of course, you can make your own communication schedule as long as it implements um, check-in blackout, and there's some tools to make these somewhat easier to make. Okay, so then this is where the, the fun part in theory, or sorry, are there any questions? <laughs> I'm standing and have coffee, so I can. <laughs> um, okay, so custom agents. So this is what we actually are kind of interested in. So, so far, what we've done is essentially something that's just a generalization of petting zoo, but we want to now put agents into these roles and actually talk about how we can do that in a fairly, in hopefully a fairly straightforward way. So we've trained a little waypointing agent. Here it is. Well, we're just, it's uh, weights anyway. Um, so we said we need two things. One, we want um, waypoints. So, so we want a, um, an interface. So we want something that tells us uh, what commands, what parameters can this agent take. Um, and second, we want um, an actual model for the agent, right? So the interface is really simple. It's just going to basically um, implement a action dictionary. So it's just a, as something that's like a box, um, well, an action box, because it also needs to have some default, some more information about what to do in the case that um, no explicit action is given. Um, and then our agent, uh, oh, but so the reason for this is basically, um, the controller agnostic part of coach. So, um, the other thing that we wanted to be able to do is say, I don't want to test this on one way pointer. I want to test this on five or 10. I want to be able to compare the one that I trained using reinforcement learning with the one from control theory, with the one from, you know, something that I programmed. How does it react to the same series of commands? And can we compare those things? So basically we wanted the interface to be um, disjointed potentially from the underlying model so that we can actually test these things. Um, so the interface, an interface is a fairly straightforward thing. So here's for our waypointer. Um, we just need to fill in the action box. In this case, um, you know, our low is going to be you know, just the things that we said before. So, uh, oops, it's a very simple box. It's just relative waypoints. So relatively, there's nothing that's gonna be, oh, it's actually not true, is it? It's relative. So our box goes from zero to one, but it could go from minus one to one, depending on what size box you're on. So I have made a terrible mistake. Um, and that's basically it. So with these action boxes, you can also include uh, more of a description of what of what um, the thing actually is, a human readable description. And then that can be queried. So for instance, on the interface, I show you it'll automatically query that and put it up on the interface. Um, great, so that's our little, inter our little interface. It's very simple. Just tells you what parameters can go in to 
the agent. Uh, the agent is also very simple. It just needs to implement a couple of things. Um, it needs to take a role. Uh, this is because um, the role can really matter. So even if it's the same agent, um, you know, or it's like sort of formally the same, you know, so it's a waypointer agent that uses features. And, um, the role can dictate what sensors it has. It can dictate all sorts of things. So um, it needs to take a role. It needs to have a reset function. And then it needs to have a get action function. Um, the get action function should depend on the current observations that that agent sees and can depend on the current time steps. It doesn't have to. It's cool. Um, it then returns uh, the action and um, some agent info. So info on whether or not the agent is acting or not. So whether basically it is actually doing something or whether it's just kind of waiting for commands or sitting there. Um, whether it's finished its course of action, whether it was passed a bad coming on, and then anything else that you want to return. And all that gets saved in the trajectory as well. Um, I gave it minus two, two or something, right? So I told it to go someplace outside of the box just because, and, you know, of course I shouldn't be able to do that. And that would be stupid of me to do, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, it happens, you know? Okay, this is more of a yeah. debugging. More of a debugging feature. Um, there was There was some thought, you know, that maybe, it could that might be you know so especially if like a human was the was on the end playing with it and telling it to do things that might be relevant telemetry right to pop to pop back to a human being like you know with a computer you know sort of as soon as we detect a bad command we should just you know adjust things or something but maybe for a human that they would want to know oh okay this was a mistake but that's basically it um or that there might be some catch that you want to put in, you know, if the bad command was something that it could sort of handle, you know. Um, okay, so the waypoint actor, um, I'll give a quick explanation of it. There's basically nothing complicated about this except for stupid things. So I'll also try to flag some of the stupid things. <laughs> um, so basically, what do we do? We're just going to load in our policy. Why am I loading this as a JSON beside it, other than a zip? That is because single baselines really does not like to have more than one model instantiated at one time. So as soon as you train a model and you load in five of them and then you parallelize so that you have 20 environments, things go really badly. <laughs> um, it's, it's basically it tries to lock down CPUs. Um, and there's something that's, it's, it's a single agent thing, that's fine, it's not. I'm not really complaining about it. Um, one, we, my hope is um, one of my colleagues uh, is a high performance compute guy. And my hope is to throw him on this because in theory, of course, what we should do is just take one neural network for each of these agents that are sharing the same neural network and put that on whatever you want, right? Put it on its own dedicated CPU, its own dedicated GPU and have every environment and every role that is querying that thing going to have to but that's a technical challenge that we have not figured out yet. So for now what we're doing is we're is we're extracting the weights and just computing them using numpy. Um, so then we just set everything up. We grab from our course of action or so we check if um, we have a new command in our course of action. And we uh, check, basically, make sure that it is a waypoint command, get the parameters. We said that the that it was from minus one to one, and we know that we trained our waypointer to actually be from zero to scale. So change this. Um, which actually, that means I screwed that up with the waypointer as well. See, these are, <laughs> these are <laughs> The little, the little mistakes that at least I make all the time in reinforcement learning. Um, and then we basically set that and say, okay, is there a waypoint that I'm going towards? Yes, no, next waypoint. Um, and then so say, okay, so if I have a waypoint I'm going towards, go in and grab, compute the relative waypoint, it just does the same thing. It just goes in and says, what's the absolute position? Compute the relative position, done. Um, then throw that onto the observation. So now we have a properly sized observation space for our little trained agent. And then get its action. 
Um, if we're close enough to the waypoint, say that we're not acting anymore, say the course of action is done, so we're going to go and request a new waypoint and set the next waypoint to um, If we are not uh, sufficiently close to the waypoint, then we're acting, we get an action based on our policy. We truncate it to the action box because sometimes the policies, when you can, when you uh, talk to them directly, uh, do not return actions in the correct scale. <laughs> so uh, then there's a little choice that we have to make. Um, what do we do if we do not have a waypoint, right? So we have not been given instructions yet, and there's a lot of things we could do. We could tell them to just sit there and not do anything. Um, this is probably bad because there's poison floating around. So, so other options. In this case, what I decided to do is just say, let's give it a zero waypoint, right? Just say that the waypoint is right where you are and let it kind of figure that out with the assumption that if we've trained it well, if poison starts coming out, it'll run away, right? It's not, you know, but it, otherwise it'll kind of try to stay there. You know, maybe if food comes around, it'll try to eat food. Yes, so that, and there's definitely some tweaking that we have to do around that, you know. <laughs> um, and so then uh, return relevant information, do the reset, truncate relative waypoint, blah, 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 blah. Um, but anyway, you, see, you can see that these agents are just functions, right? So in this case, there is a neural network policy, a deep neural network policy in the background, but there's no particular reason it has to be. Um, all it needs is some interface to tell then the director, whether that's a human director or a programmatic director, how to talk to it. And the idea is, is that it's out operating in a sim. So, and in some sense, you can think of this as a digital twin, right? You know, right? There's no, nothing it's twinned with currently. But if you, you know, if you had a system with this agent on it, then this is a hopefully a way to build a quick digital twin. Great. So we can set it up. Throw so setting up, throwing it in. We just now say, um, okay. So what are these? We just need to specify the agents. Zero zero. Is this waypoint actor given this policy path? Waypoint actor given this policy path, and then we can go ahead and play around with this coaching bar. Same thing, same as before. Now it's just using an agent. Okay. So hopefully, I've justified this is at least fairly straightforward to to put an agent in. Put an agent, put a communication schedule. It, you know, as long as your agent implements, you know, something that tells it to get an action, and you know, you should be able to put it into the system. So then, how do we want to train a director? And this is where the research questions come in, because basically everything, everything that I've shown you up until now, there's really nothing behind the hood that's that's fancy. You know, it, the code maybe be optimized a little bit better. Um, you know, we've made some pretty good decisions because we've been playing around with this in a lot of different, different domains and we kind of shuffled out the, uh, what are the common things between the different domains we were playing with. But it's like, what are we doing? Well, we're taking agents and we're recording them. We have these trajectories. This is all fairly straightforward. And, and part of the reason I'm hoping it's useful to some people, because again, this is, this is all open source, steal it, use it. You know, if it's something that is useful, hopefully it can bootstrap something that you're already doing. But you know, um, what we're trying to get is because this is the interesting question. <laughs> so now we have this environment, we have these agents, we have this uh, interface. How do we train a director? Um, I mean, I can show you a silly way to do it. <laughs> so the silly way to do it. Yeah. So. The director, the planning agent, yeah. So basically, how do we, so how do we select, you know, how do we make, build these courses back? How do we do this time series? How do we build this time series? Um, I think in this case, the, the director is determining the sequence of the points. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They could be. So this, I mean, the simplest way, right, is to just pass the observations of the lowest level agents up to the director um, and similarly pass the rewards for training. Um, and we could say that we don't, I mean, the way that I kind of 
stipulated this problem was that I wanted the director to be able to see the entire board, which the lower level agents can only see their little local thing. But either way, but I mean, um, in There's a talk, sorry, there's a talk earlier that references, but in many situations, that's what you get, right? You know, you don't get a high level view of the board. You only get what your agents can see. So that's kind of, so what code sort of naturally does is that it just says, well, here's what you get. You concatenate the observations from all your agents together. You know, some, maybe some, their, some their rewards and that's what the director gets to play with. Um, but you can of course uh, change that. So, um, you know, in this case, for instance, you know, if we wanted the high level reward, then we may put another wrapper. So if we wanted, you know, the, the director to be able to see the entire board, we put another wrapper on the environment and say, hey, here's the entire board. But we are gonna return, you know, the sum of rewards to you, for instance, or something else. So I thought the observations also reach one that is oh, so it could in theory just get yeah, it could. Um, so, and that's that's so off the shelf. That will um, we have a so we have a little gym environment that will do exactly that. So you can just feed feed any agents. You, so you you set up your agents, you feed it. In, you uh, set up the coach environment. You feed the coach environment into the gym environment, and with a communication schedule. And then it just says, "Great, okay." So one step is now running forward to the next communication event. Then I stop, I return the observations from all of the agents. My action space is just the um, concatenation of all of the interfaces. Uh, the director makes a choice. And then I run forward to the next communication step. And that's a perfectly valid petting zoo gymnasium environment, right? Um, if you wanna do something, you know, so like one of the examples or this example that I have below, you know, you can do something a little bit more um, like, well, let's let's additionally, you know, extract more information about the environment so that, for instance, the director's observation space is all of the objects in the environment instead of um, the observations of the uh, of the um, agents. But that's a different problem, right? You're you're solving. You're at that point. You're fundamentally solving a different problem. So it's just a you know a problem that's closer to my heart than. But so, so yeah. you, mm -hmm. does it work well? Or why are you looking for it? Um so the it does yeah, does it not work well? Right. So yeah, mostly the reasons that I am thinking about a different problem is because that's what the domain, you know, the actual problems that have come up. We do know global information, but the agents don't. And so there's some interplay there. Um, however, so I, I haven't noticed anything. I would say that this is that this is a, a early enough stages that I certainly I wouldn't want to make any claim, any universalized claims about um, which method is going to be better in general. I think that if you have, um, so if we think about this this environment here, um, so I mean, this is, this is a really good question, by the way. This is not this is not a this is not a trivial question. <laughs> so if you think about this environment here, right? Um, the extent to which uh, the agent sensors canvas the environment is going to really change what the problem is um, from being much more of a how do they learn an efficient search strategy to how do they um, learn to prioritize targets, right? If the range is sufficiently small, then there's no target prioritization at all. It's just search strategy. Um, and if it's, you know, it's, it's blind search strategy, how do you blindly search a, a certain space? And if it's sufficiently large, then, um, then it's just prioritization. And you often get these sort of two phase problems in RL, whereas you start changing the parameters around um, you really enter a different phase. I mean, so the space domain is another fun one where um, you have these orbital drift dynamics. So if you assume that your time scale is fast and you can use a lot of fuel, um, then everything's basically Euclidean, right? There's no, no orbital dynamics coming at all. But if you assume that something's about on an orbital period, then all of a sudden, you know, going from point A to point B 
with the orbital moment, uh, with the orbital motion is trivial. You just turn your engines off and go there. <laughs> Whereas going this exact same distance the other way requires a huge amount of thrust or requires going the other way around. And suddenly time becomes very dependent. So there's all these problems in this world that have very different phases. And one of the things, so one of the hopes is that by doing this breaking up of the problem hierarchically, the other thing that you're doing is, you know, if you train a really good wave pointer, then I don't need you to solve this problem. I can use it to solve many different problems, right? As long as the observation space and the action space are the same, I can suddenly train direct, I can reuse this, you know, to solve a bunch of different problems. Um, you know, if I have good finite pieces, then I can start to construct an algebra and I can start to, you know, say not just this problem, but many. Um, but, uh, you know, that is, you know, but they are fundamentally different problems, right? Um, you know, and one of the, one of the fundamental differences is, you know, what is the, uh, what is the knowledge that we get? Um, you know, we as the operators or we as, as the director agent or whatever, is it just the information from the observation spaces of the, um, of the agents or do we have more global information? And so that's a, that's really not trivial question. If, um, well, that's, that's not trivial. It's, it's, a re, it's a really domain specific question and a really interesting one. <laughs> um, so coach will just naturally concatenate the observation spaces. But if you want to do something different, then you can. Yeah. So say, since you're on a low level, you can have to reverse the power since you're in the distance to the impact. Yep. But then my question is, what is the optimality of the higher rate? So that's just something that's aggregating all of the lower rate towards. And so you can kind of like kind of collaborate with each other. Yes. Is that something easy to do? Yeah, so that's that, so that there's a real danger there, um, and uh, so that is one of the reasons that so the the way that we're formulating this problem in is that the lower level agents are frozen. Um, so the higher level agent also is not going to get any reward based on the agents going getting to the waypoint. So you could put that environment back in, but um, probably what we want to do is put in the original environment. Right, where the reward is just based on how much they eat. So they don't get any reward for going to the waypoint successfully because it's assumed that that has been solved in the low level because you can absolutely will get collaboration between the high level and the low level agents if you are not careful about separating their rewards from each other. <laughs> they will figure out ways to, you know, to hack your reward structure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, but this and this is a. But you know, on the other hand, that means that we're not doing scope discovery here. Um, you know, this this framework is assuming that you know what the low level agents are going to be, and that you have that you have supplied them one way or another, um, and then you're just training the high level agent. But if you do that, so if you have supplied them, then. Um, basically spinning this environment up. So, I mean, the way, you know, go through, I'm running out of time, but we can, you know, you go through, specify um, basically what are the classes that can, um, you know, in this case, this can all be automated, you know, in some YAML files or something like that. But like, you know, so what are the environment parameters in the underlying environment? You know, what are the schedule, the communication schedule parameters, blah, 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 blah. And um, let me see. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, I will skip it to the end. So um, you can uh, do that, and at that point, you can just train it as so. This now, um, this is just a petting zoo environment, and you can train it using pseudo baselines or or all the or anything else. Yeah. Oh, so just back to the previous uh, Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, in the long run, do you want uh, this high level, high level agents to kind of make decisions based on what is observed by the system? Or do you just want this computer system that just did whatever goes to the end of the world? Yeah, so it depends on the problem. Um, in some problems, you want, you know, in some, well, in some problems, 
the only information that you have is based on the low level agents, right? Um, you know, and other in other problems, uh, you do have additional information that you want to supply. And so again, so the way that this handles it is that if you don't have any additional information, then you can just use the the coach gym, the coach petting zoo environment, and it'll do that the way you go. Um, if you do have additional information that you want to supply, then you'll need to subclass it or grab it or something and add that additional information in. Um, then if you do that though, so, I mean, we, we have built out this um, dash interface that, so this is, I'm just, no, of course I'm not, <laughs> because I didn't install dash. Um, but yeah, so then this thing is a petting zoo environment and it just, you can train it with wherever you want. Um, petting zoo uh, stuff. Why is this? Thank you. <laughs> um, so you can train it with whatever uh, trains petting zoo environments, and we'll, you know, depending on it, the simulation or the situation, it works, you know, reasonably well. I would say that at this point, um, this setup works often comparably to slightly worse than just training it, um, just training the simulation uh, without doing this hierarchical thing. And we would like to get that to better because, you know, basically, you know, this, when, if you do this, so this, and again, this is just, I don't care if you steal, steal this code, use it, don't use it. You know, this is basically just for some rapid prototyping to get this stuff in front of, um, you know, interested parties. So, you know, so once you do this, it will then load in, you know, okay, your plan generator, simulate plans. If you provide a nice dash backend for a full trajectory, it will um, do that. Otherwise we'll see here, it'll produce a GIF. Um, and uh, and produce, oh, there should be telemetry here. I wonder if that didn't show up. Um, but then this is human editable, you know. Simulatable, so it, it does. It does. Oh yeah, this is gonna yell at me because I didn't specify. Sorry, didn't make my SI. The box was from zero to one, so. <laughs> um, but the uh, so it, the idea again is you know to, that hopefully these are some tools that will be helpful. Um, because the other thing, again, you know, I'm so I just, you know, the first crack at this that we took was to use Petting Zoo again and use RL again because, okay, we have some game that we're trying to play and we're, you know, it's very non smooth, you know, as you move actions past each other, it's a non community, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. But there's no reason that that's the best way to generate plans. That's, that's a way that's somewhat universal. Um, but there, Maybe much better ways. I mean, you know, maybe we iterate integer programming with um, you know some gradient based methods, right? You know, maybe we use population based methods and some, you know, evolution of graphs. There's a whole there's a group out of Australia that's doing that's trying to codify plans in terms of some graph theory stuff. You know, maybe we go that way. Um, so there's I think that there's really interesting. Well, I think they're really interesting, and I really hope that uh, other people do as well because it's a big enough space, and I'm. Not, you know, we're too small of a team to really explore a lot of this stuff. So that is my hopefully, um, hopefully this was interesting. Uh, again, you know, these are this is all open sourced and open sourced in the way that, like, you know, we will. I I can at least guarantee that we will continue working on it in the near future, um, <laughs> because you know we have funding to do so, and you know the and. Our collaborators at Act Three are very interested in this, and they were the ones that pushed us to open source it and to, you know, try to get more buy-in from the community. So, hopefully, um, you know, if you have any interest in in working on this, please contact me or you know, working with this, and it's uh, it will hopefully be something that is continuing into the future. So, thank you guys very much for attending. So, thank you.